Goshen, Indiana is a small town whose name means a place of peace and plenty. It has approximately 35,000 people and is located in the northern part of the state near the Michigan border. The city is best known for the manufacture of recreational vehicles and its County 4-H Fair, which is one of the largest in the United States. The town is also home to Nathan Parsons, a 30-year-old man who, well, to be blunt, had very little going for him. Parsons had a good upbringing, but showed little aptitude for, well, much of anything. He spent his time chasing girls at school with very little success, and this was a real problem for him. Maybe it dented his pride or his ego. He obviously believed in himself to be something of a ladies' man. But nothing could be further from the truth. He was a very full-on person, which women found both suffocating and a little creepy. He resented the reaction and the rejection and would often become verbally abusive as a result. There was, however, one girl who attracted his attention more than others, Cassie Crawford. Cassie was good-looking and intelligent with a sensible personality. She was dedicated and focused on her schoolwork and had no time for relationships. Nathan was kind of annoying at school. I did not want any kind of relationship with him, really, but I'm not a mean person, so I was happy to be friendly to him. He seemed harmless enough. Nathan seems to have taken Cassie's gestures of friendship in the wrong context. He believed he had strong feelings for her, but in truth, it was more of an infatuation or even an obsession, probably because she was the only young woman who gave him the time of day. But whatever those feelings and the reasons for them, they would linger on for a long time. But more on that later. As life continued and Nathan got older, you would think he would have matured, as the majority of us do, but he didn't. Nathan seemed to live a Peter Pan lifestyle. He couldn't and didn't want to hold down a proper job. When Parsons hit his teenage years, he had some choices, just like everyone else does. He could continue with his education or maybe get an apprenticeship, but he chose to do neither. Young people in education usually do the same things in their free time. They socialize, they drink, they go to parties and have a good time. Something else that can creep into this process are recreational drugs. We don't condone their use, but it is a simple fact. Many people experiment when they're younger, but eventually they leave that lifestyle behind. Unfortunately, for a minority, they don't leave that lifestyle behind. They either can't be bothered to go and get a job, or they continue to experiment. Eventually, it leaves them hooked on different substances. Nathan Parsons was one such case. Instead of continuing down life's long and winding road, he remained stationary, lost with no direction or life goals, and continued to consume illegal substances, gateway drugs, as they're sometimes described because often they lead to other, even more damaging ones. His drug use was no longer recreational. It was now a full-blown addiction. He had moved on to one of the strongest and worst substances ever discovered by man, heroin. For any young listeners out there, please take a warning. Drug use only leads one way. Don't do it. A warning that Nathan Parsons would have done well to listen to. He was now living from one little plastic bag to the next. Addiction becomes a way of life. Your first thought in the morning and last thought you have at night will be, where is my next fix coming from? And this is how Nathan was living. An addict like Nathan will stop at nothing to keep themselves supplied. Such is the nature of drugs that do take over the body. He had resorted to stealing, not just from strangers, but from the very man who brought him up, his stepfather, Richard Parsons. Nathan was taking his credit cards to buy items and then turn around and sell them to use the cash to fund his addiction. He took items from around the home to sell, and if Richard had any cash in his wallet or around the home, it would disappear into thin air. To add to this, Nathan was wanted for burglary, but had managed to evade the law for now. You may think, how bad could his behavior get? You may not believe it, but we have just begun. Cassie Crawford is now trapped in the trunk of a pickup truck and continues to speed down a road. Lodged in the truck, she is battling with shock and panic over her situation. As the vehicle turns left and right at high speeds, she's being slammed around inside the back of the truck. 
anyone would be terrified if they faced this scenario. Thankfully, Cassie discovered what many people do when their lives are in danger. She was stronger than she gave herself credit for. In a remarkable show of mental strength, Cassie realizes that panic is not going to help her, and she begins to think more clearly. At first, I didn't know what to do. What can you do? I was thrown into the trunk of a vehicle without warning. Before I processed what was happening, I was listening to the sound of the engine humming in my ears and being violently and uncontrollably thrown in all directions around the inside of a pitch-black trunk. As Cassie began to calm down, her mind became clearer. With the uncertainty of her situation, she knew she had to act fast. The first thing she does is try to find her cell phone. That is not an easy task, given the darkness of the confined space and the movement of the vehicle, but fortunately, she manages to find her phone, and at 10.06 a.m., she calls 911. Cassie's first words were, I need help. Someone threw me into the back of their truck. The operator asks if she has any idea where she's going, clearly trying to establish which road she may have been kidnapped from so police could try to intercept the vehicle. But Cassie, unsurprisingly, had no idea. The 911 operator presses Cassie again for any clues as to which direction she's headed. Cassie replies frantically, I don't know. I'm in the back of a truck. The cab is closed. They kidnapped me from school. They threw me in the back of a truck and shut the leather cover. The 911 operator now tries to establish other facts to help police trace the vehicle. They ask Cassie how many people kidnapped her and was the kidnapper male or female. Cassie responds telling them that it was one man on his own. The operator then asked what might be considered an odd question, given the frantic nature of Cassie's kidnapping. What is his name? Surely the police didn't expect a positive ID on the man who abducted her so quickly. But amazingly, in this instance, Cassie knew exactly who the perpetrator was. She answered, Nathan Parsons. She went on to say, please, I need help. Cassie repeats urgently. The operator, remaining calm and professional, continues to extract more information from Cassie as much as she can. This was the only way authorities had to find her. They asked what kind of vehicle it was. It's a black Ford with an extended cab and a black cover that goes over the back of the truck. One has to admire Cassie at this point. She had a matter of seconds between being grabbed by a man and thrown into a truck she used her incredible mental strength to see who was kidnapping her and get a description of the vehicle and even the make. Knowing that time was of the essence, dispatch immediately put out a call to all officers stating that they needed to find the black pickup truck ASAP. Police didn't have much to go on, but at least it was something, and the hunt was on. The operator's job wasn't over yet. Far from it. If you've ever phoned emergency services, you'll remember that they keep you on the phone until the relevant service reaches you. 911 now continued to keep Cassie talking, reassuring her that the call had gone out and help was on the way. The operator asks if Parsons is a student at the college. Cassie replied, No, I went to school with him years ago. He wanted me to be in a relationship with him, but I didn't want to. I haven't seen him in 10 years. I can't deny that at the time I was terrified, but thank God for the lady I spoke to at 911. She continued to ask me questions and kept me talking. It was kind of annoying at the time. I kept thinking, why is this relevant? Why is this important? When are the police going to get here? But looking back, it really helped me to temporarily keep my mind busy and not panic. She kept calm the whole time, which helped me. But I suppose the emergency services wouldn't be very reassuring if they panicked about every situation they faced. The 911 operator said, Sure, I stayed calm. I have to. My job is to get as much information from the person on the other end of the phone as possible. I've got to give the officers out in the field the best chance possible of helping poor people like Cassie. But I have to say, she was great. Not everyone can manage to stay as calm as she did under that amount of pressure. The snippets of information she managed to give us were invaluable. If she ever considers a career change, maybe she could come and do my job. She's perfect for it. Cassie was in a very vulnerable position. She was in immediate danger, but she wasn't the only one at risk from Parsons. 
His crime spree hadn't started and ended with Cassie Crawford. The day before Cassie had been kidnapped, Nathan was going about his life in the usual manner, looking to get a hold of any cash any way possible. Addiction doesn't stay the same. The body develops a certain immunity to illegal substances in the same way it can to over-the-counter meds such as antibiotics, if they're overused. This resulted in Nathan needing an ever-increasing amount of drugs to satisfy his body's yearnings. Nathan was clearly having no luck. Make no mistake, when an addict needs a substance, they will go to unimaginable lengths to satisfy themselves. Woodville Gardens Mobile Home Park, Mindy Lane in Goshen, around midnight on the 14th of November 2011. A 69-year-old man is sitting watching TV, minding his own business. His name, Richard Parsons, a well-liked man who had just retired a couple of years earlier. But Richard, although very popular around the neighborhood, had a few problems of his own, one of those being his stepson, Nathan. As he was watching television, his cell phone rang. It was Nathan. He wanted to come into the trailer, and Richard, being the good stepfather, went to the door to let him in. But Nathan was there for one reason only. Money. There was no, how are you, Dad? Good to see you. Nathan began shouting at him and grabbing Richard's possessions. He wanted his credit cards, his checkbook, cash, anything that would be worth a few dollars. Richard, who had been putting up with this behavior for years, seems to have had enough of being used as a ATM. Tina Hunt, a friend and neighbor of Richard's, walked past that night on her usual route as she walked her dog. I always walk my dog around the same time each night and along the same path. It was sometime between midnight and 1 a.m. that I went past Richard's trailer. Strangely, I heard loud shouting. It was Richard's voice. He was rowing with another man. I found it really strange because Richard never raised his voice. He was quite soft-spoken, if anything. A really nice man, always had a smile on his face and always said hello. People really liked him. But I thought it was none of my business. I didn't want to get involved in anything personal, so I carried on with my dog and went home. What Tina heard was the sound of a 69-year-old man trying to defend himself and his possessions from his drug-starved stepson, Nathan. Tragically, but realistically, a man who is nearly 70 years of age has slim chance of overpowering someone who is nearly 30 years old, and so it played out. A physical altercation broke out between the two men after Nathan started grabbing and taking anything he could get his hands on. Nathan overpowered his stepfather and pushed him to the ground. Without any consideration or empathy for the man who had brought him up, he relentlessly kicked and punched Richard until he was covered in blood, unable to move or defend himself any longer. Nathan was in such an enraged state, he didn't stop there. He climbed on top of Richard, forcefully grabbing him by the neck, and strangled him to death. The next thing anyone saw or heard from the trailer was at approximately 10.30 a.m. on the 15th of November. Tina, Richard's friend, described what she saw. I heard the door of a nearby trailer slam shut, and I looked out my window and saw it was a younger man in his late 20s, early 30s maybe. He seemed in a rush, not really panicky, but he was definitely in a hurry to get somewhere. I assumed he was late for work or something. He walked quickly toward Richard's Ford F-150 pickup truck and drove off. He drove so fast that the wheels spun on the ground, and that was the last time I saw him. In actual fact, as I'm sure you can guess, Nathan wasn't late for work. He didn't go to work ever. He had taken Richard's laptop, Xbox, credit cards, and checkbook, went off to sell them so he could buy heroin as quick as he could. Less than a day later, as we sadly know, Cassie Crawford would find herself at the mercy of this drug-ridden, dangerous murderer who had lost all grip on reality. Cassie had played her part in helping the police. She had given them as much information as she possibly could. Her fate would now be decided by the efficiency and the ability of the police in tracking down that Ford pickup truck. Cassie may not have been thinking about it at the time, but the odds of her being found safe relied on Nathan taking her on a long drive. If they remained on the roads, the police had a chance of spotting the vehicle. If they pulled into a residential area or into a house that may have a garage, her chances would not be good. 
and the authorities knew it. The 911 operator asked Cassie how long she had been in the truck, guessing as best she could. Cassie estimated around 10 minutes. Taking a different approach, the operator wanted to know who Parsons knew and where he might go in Adams County. But there was a problem. Parsons wasn't from Adams County. Cassie hadn't seen him in 10 years and couldn't think of anywhere he would go or have any idea of who he may know in the area. Cassie continued to plead for help down the phone, but suddenly, in the middle of one of those pleas, her voice cuts out. The operator calls her name but gets no response. The phone had gone dead. As long as Cassie was on the phone, the police could use GPS to find out what area she was in based on where her phone pinged off of different cell phone towers, but if the phone wasn't connected, they had nothing to go on. The problem with relying on GPS via cell phones is that they have to be in a set triangulation area for a good period of time for an exact location to be pinpointed. If a vehicle is traveling at speed, it will go through many different areas, connecting with multiple towers along the way, leaving authorities with only a rough estimate as to someone's location. This made Adams County a bad location to track anyone. It is an exceptionally rural area with an untold number of side roads and dirt tracks that could be used instead of main highways. If someone wanted to evade the law, it wouldn't necessarily be that difficult as long as they kept moving. To the relief of the 911 operator and the officers in pursuit, six minutes later, Cassie called 911 again. Unfortunately, she didn't get through to the same operator this time and had to explain her situation again. But fortunately, as she was halfway through giving the details, someone in the dispatch office overheard the call and recognized it as Cassie. Every minute, of course, was crucial. Not a second could be wasted. It was literally a race against time. Cassie is advised that even if she can't talk, she has to keep the line open to the police. They did their best to reassure her that help was on the way. By this point, Cassie had been locked in the trunk of a pickup truck for 16 minutes. It is remarkable that she had managed to stay calm throughout her ordeal. Fortunately for law enforcement, Parsons, without knowing it, gave them a fighting chance of finding him. Cassie said, We just turned left. We are on a gravel road. This gave the police a better chance because now, he was on a side road that would likely stay in the same triangulation area, or at least it was more likely to be, than if he had continued to speed down a highway. However, Cassie's ordeal was far from over. Police knew that he was turning off the main road. That could mean that Nathan was close to his intended destination, and that could only mean trouble for Cassie. The operator told her, if he stops, do not turn your phone off or disconnect the call. Keep it connected in your pocket. Cassie manages to inform the operator that they had taken a right turn, but were still driving on gravel. As soon as she relays the message, she cuts out again. The officers in pursuit continue to drive as fast as they can towards the last known location with fears that it might be too late. The highway officers act on the only bit of information they have. Adams County officers tell them that if they turn left off of Matthias Road, it will turn into a gravel road. It isn't much to go on, but it is all they have. The cops have finally pinpointed the gravel road used by Parsons, but he was a moving target, and they were at least a couple of minutes behind him. Thankfully, Parsons' luck was about to run out. Fortunately for Cassie, Parsons turns back onto the main road at the exact time one of the pursuing officers was flying by. There was no mistaking the Ford pickup truck. The officer gives chase and radios the other units. The police immediately set up a roadblock down the highway and wait, their weapons pointed at the vehicle. Parsons was approaching fast and showing no signs of stopping. As he gets near the roadblock, the police bravely stand their ground, but he swerves into the grass and tries to go around them. The officers couldn't take the risk of shooting and injuring Cassie at the same time. That was something that Parsons was probably gambling on. What he didn't take into consideration, though, was Mother Nature. He had gone around the roadblock easy enough, but he couldn't straighten the vehicle back up to get on the road. He drove desperately at high speed into a nearby field where the truck became bogged down in mud. The officers closed in fast, handguns drawn and shouts of get out of the vehicle, hands on your head. 
They slowly approached the vehicle from all angles, not knowing what to expect. Perhaps to their surprise, Parsons knew his game was up. He slowly put his hands out of the driver's side window and opened the door from the outside. He stepped out slowly, raised his hands to his head. The first officer approaches, grabs Parsons, and slams him against the side of the Ford. At 10.40 a.m., after the desperate chase that had spanned two counties and 30 minutes, the police finally had him in handcuffs. The back of the vehicle was opened immediately by another officer. Cassie was discovered frightened, relieved, shaken, but most importantly, unharmed. The whole thing seems like a bad dream now it's all over, but it wasn't. This was real. My whole life flashed before my eyes. As soon as he turned onto that gravel road, I thought to myself, this is it. I'm never going to be seen again. Those roads can lead anywhere. You could be killed out in the vast wilderness, buried, and no one would ever find you. Thank God these cops and the 911 operators were so determined and devoted to their jobs. I don't think I would be here now if it wasn't for them. I am so lucky to be alive. Sergeant Scott Kuntz is an Ohio State Highway Patrol officer who gave chase to Parsons. He said, After 15 years on the force, I have never experienced anything like that. I still remember the moment dispatch radioed that they had lost the GPS signal. I was starting to think the worst, especially as we heard he had turned onto a gravel road. If you're coming off the main highway, that tends to be bad, but it seems he was just trying to give us the slip. With Parsons now in the Brown County Jail being held without bond, the police didn't need to do a whole lot of investigation. They had caught him in the act of kidnapping with a handgun on the passenger seat, they do believe his intention was to kill Cassie and then turn the gun on himself. Police, of course, had to notify the family what happened, but when they tried to tell Richard Parsons what happened, they discovered the true horror that Nathan Parsons had inflicted. Neighbors informed the officers what they had seen and heard the day before. They decide to force entry into the property and discover what looks to be a chaotic scene. A struggle had clearly taken place. On the face of it, it looked like a robbery. Possessions were missing. Richard had no cash or cards or checkbook. But where was he? As they do with all robberies, officers conducted a search of the property. One officer checked a closet and discovered something both unexpected and horrifying. Richard Parsons' lifeless corpse spilled out onto the floor. He had been dead for some time. He had cuts and dark bruising around his neck, which only occurs when someone has been strangled intensely. Emergency services were called immediately, and neighbors witnessed their much-loved, friendly neighbor being taken out of a trailer in a body bag. His neighbor Tina spoke afterwards, clearly furious. I hope his stepson gets the death penalty. I really do. Mr. Parsons did not deserve to die like that. He was a good man who never said an unkind word to anyone. When Nathan's mother and Richard's ex-wife, Phyllis Parsons, was informed, she was shocked. Nobody deserves to die like that. It's such a shame. We purchased that trailer in 1974. We were the first people to move into that trailer park. He didn't deserve that. Richard Parsons leaves behind a daughter, Kathleen, age 46, and another stepson who lived in the same trailer park but has chosen to remain anonymous. Parsons was set to go on trial in September of 2012, but before the hearing could begin, his lawyer, probably knowing full well that his client could face the death penalty, convinced Nathan to sue for a plea bargain. On July 20th, he was sentenced to life without parole. Parsons didn't go on trial for the kidnap and homicide. He was wanted for offenses, as we mentioned earlier. He was also tried for aggravated robbery and failure to comply with a lawful order, plus a string of other offenses for drugs and alcohol. After a short time in prison, he was back in court again, this time for assaulting a prison guard. Nathan had confessed to the murder of his stepfather with very little resistance. It seems he didn't even care about what he had done. Far from being repentant about the killing of his stepfather, Parsons admitted freely that he went into the home that night already thinking about the best way to kill him. After killing him, Parsons also admitted to stamping on his neck just to make sure he was dead. 
The judge's final words to Parsons were, Based on all the facts and recommendations made, I will impose a prison term of life. You will not be eligible for parole, and you will be in prison until death. Parsons was led away, never to be allowed near decent society again. The streets will be a much safer place, with Nathan Parsons' drug-fueled criminal behavior gone. But as always, here at Beyond Evil, we bring you these cases not to spread hate, but to tell the horrific ordeals law-abiding citizens are subjected to by some of the most evil members of our community. Cassie Crawford is fortunate in that now she will be able to live a normal life, free from harassment or fear of someone like Nathan Parsons following her again. Had it not been for the combination of her calm head and the diligence of law enforcement, she may not have been so lucky. Richard Parsons was not so fortunate. He had worked hard his entire life, an unblemished 30-year career, and was just settling down to enjoy his retirement before his life was cut short by a member of his own family, someone he had loved and cared for all of his life. Rest in peace, Richard. We sincerely hope that those affected by the horrific actions of the unhinged Nathan Parsons can now put these horrific events to rest. As for Nathan Parsons, well, we can only be thankful that he will never walk the streets of anywhere again. Society is certainly a better place without him.